It's a worldwide view of the best of Australia and New Zealand. And as I was mentioning, um, well, my name is Jennifer Burge and thank you so much to Kristen and Sonal for organizing this and for the, um, for the destination series from Global Ties Arizona. I am um, excited to be here and uh, a dual Aussie American citizen. So I have a little bit of insight about what this region of the world is like. So I'm gonna sh share with you what I think the best spots are. So let's go forward, please. In Australia, uh, every gathering, pretty much, whether it's a business meeting or a community meeting, um, but something like this, we would start with a land acknowledgement. So I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. And it's funny, uh, in the United States, you know, you never hear anything like this, you never hear any acknowledgement of the traditional landholders, but uh, in Australia, it is, it, most meetings will start that way. The picture here is one that I took, uh, and all the photos are mine, by the way, nothing is internet robbery. Um, this picture is from Kakadu National Park, the Aboriginal people, they're, when their DNA was studied, there is evidence that their ancestors go back at least 50,000 years. And Kakadu National Park is in the uh, Northern Territory. And it is known, the, the, the drawings, the cave drawings in that particular park represent one of the longest historical records of any groups of people in the world. So the, some of those drawings from this particular park are 20,000 years old. And I can remember standing there looking at these thinking, how is that even possible that I can still see this? Anyway, what's next is the wine. We're going to start with uh, New Zealand. So if you would go forward, please. Oh, sorry. Oh, and we're not. Joke. Uh, so why, why do you hear this American voice talking about Australia? Well, because I am an Aussie citizen. These photos are from my citizenship ceremony on July 14th, 2017, when I became an Aussie. And the only reason I put these pictures in here was for actual evidence that I am a citizen at number two, because I found it absolutely hilarious that they had a screen of the of Queen Elizabeth at the ceremony that everyone should take pictures with. And so obviously I had to do that. And no disrespect to Her Majesty, but I do find that really interesting. I love Next. that. <laughs> I think it's but, now, now we can get to the wine. The, no, the wine is so much more interesting than looking at uh, my photos of with the flag. So the first wine that uh, we wanted to share with you tonight is the it's the Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand and the winery is called and I don't know if you have been able to taste it or if you were able to find it Kristen oh, it's like magically disappearing <laughs> not even by my hand but um if you were able to find it, it's really delicious. So thank you, Kristen, for finding this. She found it at Costco and it's awesome. So this is one of the newer wineries in um, New Zealand. It's the name Craggy Range. Uh, the only reason I put that picture of myself in here is because in the background, you see those mountains and that is the Craggy Range that surrounds the actual winery. And that's what's on the label as well. So that's what the winery is named for are the mountains that surround it. It's absolutely a stunning spot that produces some killer wine. So if you did, if you were able to find it, I hope you enjoy it. Next. So New Zealand vital statistics. We were, we're going to start with going through the top spots of uh, New Zealand, at least according to me. You will see a repetitive theme where there is a lot of water and a lot of wildlife in all of my photos. New Zealand is, uh, has a population of under 5 million people. And I would like to supplement that particular fact with the, the, uh, to, by letting you know that there are more sheep in New Zealand than people just so you know. In case anyone ever asks you that question on trivia, you know what the answer is. Uh, surface area, 103,000 square miles. The capital is Wellington. You can see where that is on the map at the bottom of the North Island. Whenever you hear people speak about New Zealand, if you haven't 
been there yourself or have much experience, you'll hear you'll hear people say, well, is that on the North Island or the South Island? The two are dramatically different from one another. Uh, the They're both not so inhabited, let's say, but the largest cities lay on the North Island, Auckland, Wellington, uh, are, are Wellington, or excuse me, both of which you'd probably be surprised by how many people they have. Auckland uh, has a lot of challenges with having enough sufficient housing at affordable prices, uh, but it is absolutely stunning. Uh, the South Island is the, the mountain range that goes across the South Island is known as the Southern Alps. It is absolutely majestic and I don't ever use that word. <laughs> so uh, it's really stunning. If you were, take my advice, if you have the chance to go to New Zealand, you haven't been yet, I would make a few stops in the North Island and then I would spend most of my time down South because it's just amazingly beautiful. Not like anything on this planet, it feels like. So the, the spots that I've mentioned here are the Coromandel Bay, which is actually it's a peninsula. So forgive my um, inaccurate geography there. Uh, so you can see where that is. It's actually the reason I included it is up near Auckland and it's a very quick trip from Auckland. You can take a ferry across the Coromandel. If you fly into Auckland you can make the trip across to um, this beautiful stunning area in uh, less than two hours and you can drive all the way around which is also beautiful and that's about a four hour trip but the point is if you don't have a lot of time to spend in New Zealand it's an amazing place to see. Uh, I also mentioned the Bay of Islands, Kaikoura, Mount Cook, and Fjordland, Fjordland National Park. Uh, Fjordland is at the very bottom of the south, Bay of Islands, the very top of the north, Kaikoura, middle of the bottom of the south island, Mount Cook also on the south island. And I'll share with you more details and photos of what those look like. The Coromandel Bay. Most pictures from New Zealand look like this with this sort of hazy, wet thing going on. It's like permanently London. And, and actually the people are very much, they have a similar personality type, I think, to uh, people from the UK. Um, so even though, as I mentioned, it's close to some major metropolitan centers like Auckland, it's really uninhabited and it's beautiful. There's these pictures at the bottom are from Ha He Beach, which you can take, uh, little, what do you call that? <laughs> I know what the Aussies call it, but it's like a dinghy. I don't know, like, a, but you could take a boat trip. You could take a boat trip uh, around this bay. And there are several really fascinating spots um, in this area, but it's, it's, yeah, it's not a lot of people. The other thing that's awesome about New Zealand as compared to Australia is that there is no, uh, there's no wildlife that wants to kill you, <laughs> just to put it succinctly. Uh, you, there's there's not, not even any snakes in the whole of New Zealand, which is super weird. All right, next. <laughs> the Bay of Islands is at the top of the North Island. And this was the, my first, one of my first experiences with New Zealand. It has 74 islands. It's the area where Captain Cook first landed and he named the region in 1769. It was the first area to be settled by Europeans. Uh, stunningly beautiful. Again, these pictures are mostly from Paihia, which is a city in the Bay of Islands. City is a big word, we'll call it a town. Um, most important thing to know about Paihia in this region is that you can visit the Waitangi Treaty Grounds. And the Waitangi Treaty Grounds are where the Maori people signed the treaty with the uh, British crown. Um, I think the date is here in 1840. And the Maori people fought for their rights extensively. Uh, and this particular treaty was, this ceremony was attended by 540 chiefs. So, and you can actually visit the grounds. That red boat in the bottom is a, a, a waka, which is a war boat, uh, a Maori war boat. So anyway, you can see all this stuff there and it's spectacular. And then go sailing. So next. <laughs> Anyone tried the wine? Good. It's delicious. Good. So Kaikoura. Kaikoura is uh, in the South Island and it's just a little bit north of Christchurch. I think it's maybe one hour's drive, perhaps a little bit more. Uh, it is again spectacular for its wildlife and its coastal views. If you see that picture there with the dolphins, we were out on the water. I, uh, we, we spotted pods of up to 900 dolphins at once. I think I swam with over a hundred. 
and they're so used to the people that they they swim with you and they play with you. They make you spin around and around and around <laughs> just to mess with your head. So um, dolphins are very smart in case you didn't know. So that's um, one of the things you can do there, but it's um, the wildlife there and the coastline uh, really not much compares to this. It was devastated. Uh, the access road to it was devastated in one of the recent earthquakes. Um, but it has recovered very well, and you can uh, you can easily visit and have these tremendous experiences. This place is something else. F Fjordland National Park at the bottom of the South Island. You you need to go to Ta Lake Tayano, and there's a strip mall, <laughs> a few restaurants, uh, some lakeside development. Uh, there's not really go a lot going on in, in Lake Tayano, but uh, which is the picture that is in the upper right hand corner is the lake. It's so spectacular. It's just the scenery is um, nothing, nothing like you, you've seen before. And then from there, you drive down into Fjordland National Park, which covers 5,000 square miles and much of it humans have never walked on. And while you're there, you can visit Doubtful Sound and Milford Sound, which are fjords, and take boat trips in there. And you see the, like that lobster, we caught that lobster on the boat, on the way, and then it served it up that night for dinner. So it doesn't really get much fresher than that. Uh, it's amazing to me though, this, if you look at the picture on the upper left-hand side, that's Milford Sound. And to me, it just looks prehistoric. I mean, that's just the feeling when I have there it's because it's just, there's hardly anybody around and it's not exactly widely trafficked. <laughs> so I always felt like are the dinosaur is gonna come around the corner at some point, or I don't know. Anyway, it's a, it's a beautiful national park. So I think we're gonna go on to Oh, Mount Cook, I forgot almost. Araraki is the Mori name uh, for Mount Cook. Mount Cook, it's it's a, this, a similar situation. We have a lot of uh, places in the United States which are going back to more traditional names. That's the same for Mount Cook. Uh, it was named somewhere in the 19, 18, 1900s and then now it's more commonly known as Araraki. Uh, it's known for mountain climbing, but you can take a small boat uh, onto the Glacial Lake. Yes, you can. I touched a glacier <laughs> in this lake and it is amazing. I mean, just to be able to say that that you've done that. Uh, I was here in 2010. And at that point, you know, you could still see things melting at a rapid pace. So um, I'm not sure what the situation to is today. I know that it, there are other spots in New Zealand where I've actually climbed on glaciers like Franz Josef, which you're not, you can't access anymore. You, uh, you can't climb them because they're right, they're melting too quickly. Next. Okay, folks, for those of you in the house that actually managed to pick up the wines, we're going to move to the Australian Reds and we're going to go to Penfold's Winery, uh, which is in the Barossa Valley of Australia, which is the most well-known wine region in Australia. Um, this is a- I heard that pour. I forgot to pour it before. Here we go, everybody. This, oh, I don't know if you can see it. Anyway, it's Max's Shiraz is what we're drinking. And it's known, it's um, named for the chief winemaker from 1948 to 1975, super well-known human. And this winery is absolutely amazing. It is a Disneyland for adults. If you like wine and food, it has a killer restaurant. It's just, it's amazing. And, you know, Australians are known for their sense of humor, right? Aussies and Kiwis. So you, you go in this tremendous wine cellar with all these huge vats of wine and it's just, you know, if you like wine, it's amazing. But then you see this thing, this one vat was inspected by Helen Keller in 19, was it 1948? And I thought for sure they were full of it, you know, <laughs> Helen Keller is inspecting the wine, but no, there is photographic evidence. If you Google it, it's hilarious. So she was one of many, many famous visitors to this iconic winery uh, in the Barossa Valley, which is close to Adelaide is the biggest city. Um, and as I, I was telling Kristen earlier, they do a, a variety called the Grange. Uh, the Grange Hermitage every year by Penfolds. It, it is so, the most sought after wine in Australia. 
um, by wine collectors and wine enthusiasts. And in July of last year, a 1951 bottle of Penfolds Grange sold for $103,000. <laughs> So everyone thinks that the wine in uh, Australia is not that great because what is exported to the United States is not that great usually. <laughs> so I was gonna uh, say this this one isn't the one hundred and three thousand. No, it's not. how is it? <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Sorry, Nicole. No, it's good though. I like it for twenty bucks from Total Wine. I like it. It's great. Okay, so Penfolds.com. Now we can move on to the cool spots and statistics of Australia. So um, population, uh, so this is actually updated from the trivia, I got the correct number, 25.36 million. When I left there in 2017, they were at 24 million. So it is increasing. Uh, it's only slightly smaller than the 48 contiguous states, which I think is a surprise for a lot of people because when you look at it on a map against the United States, it looks tiny. And then people would wanna come and visit me and say, oh, I'm gonna drive from Brisbane, where I used to live, to Perth. And I say, no, you're not. <laughs> Good luck with that. I'll see you in a few months. You know, it's, it's far. Um, the capital is Canberra, which is very much set up like our uh, Washington DC district. And so the, the top spots that I've put on here to mention are the Whitsundays, Kangaroo Island. The Whitsundays are in the middle of um, East, West, East Coast Australia, just underneath, um, sorry, just above Brisbane at Airlie Beach is the access point. Kangaroo Ac Island is just a ferry ride from Adelaide. And the Great Ocean Road is near Melbourne. Margaret River is in the far west, uh, close to Perth, one hour south of Perth. And I can't see what the last one is because people are chatting. <laughs> so I don't remember, but I'm sure I, it's fine. Oh, Tasmania. Uh, so that's about a three hour uh, flight. It's a nine hour ferry from Melbourne. Anyway, moving on. The Wit Sundays. So the Great Barrier Reef gets all the press, right? And granted, it is spectacular and amazing. And the Wit Sundays are just a little bit um, south of the Great Barrier Reef district. Absolutely amazing. And the, you have to go between late autumn and spring, which is, I believe, May to October, which is the, during the migration of the humpback whales every year. So not only do you get to see this incredible marine life underwater, but you can hear the whales while you're doing it. Um, you see their manta rays, whales, that island there, or excuse me, the beaches, um, Hill Inlet and the Sundays, which I think is probably the most spectacular beach I've ever seen in my life. So amazing. Kangaroo Island off the coast of Adelaide. Uh, very few people have been here. This is the island we were talking about that is known as the Isle of the Dead. Uh, it is in the Aboriginal language. It is, it's separated from the mainland 10,000 years ago. And so the biodiversity in this region is, it, the kangaroos look incredibly different on Kangaroo Island <laughs> than they do on the mainland. And I could, I should have shown you pictures, but I didn't. So anyway, it's, it's stunning. But the energy of this island, if you're one of those people that really gets into that sort of feeling and vibe of a place, there's nothing like it in the world. The colors, the, the things that I've seen happen on this island a couple of times that I've had the chance to visit are amazing. It's also very remote and difficult to get to, just saying. Next. <laughs> the Great Ocean Road, the largest war memorial in the world, built by ex-servicemen from World War I by their counterparts who came back um, after after the war, 50, 151 mile stretch of road southeast of Australia. So you can access it from Melbourne. It is quite an amazing drive. I tried to get like the feel of driving it with those photos at the bottom because those the cliffs are really, really steep. And so uh, it's, while it is thrilling and beautiful uh, and is, the, the koalas in there are at Cape Otway National Park and one evening I spotted 16 koalas. Uh, in just hanging out in the trees. It's completely spectacular, but if I've also seen a great many accidents on this road and not, uh, not fender benders. So if you go, be careful and don't drive in the rain. Next, <laughs> Margaret River. So as you might have guessed, I am a wine enthusiast and I have been to pretty much every wine region in Australia. My favorite is Margaret River. 
It is one hour south of Perth. It is in Western Australia. Perth is closer actually to Singapore than it is to Sydney. It's very remote. But what is special about this area is you have these absolutely spectacular beaches, amazing wine, incredible food. It's like the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> if you ask me, I would just stay there forever, except it's incredibly remote. Um, it's also known for shark attacks, in case you wanted to know. <laughs> the area is a little bit dangerous in that way, but it's so worth that long trip. Next, Tasmania. So everyone, I mean, I think, doesn't everyone think Tasmanian devils? I mean, who doesn't think that, right? So in the bottom, you can see there's a Tasmanian devil, the bottom left. And I actually have pet one of them. There is a sanctuary, a Tasmanian island, sorry, Tasmanian devil sanctuary uh, near Cradle Island on Tasmania. You can go there, you can learn about them. And I'm not even joking, you hear they, the way they sound, they sound like the Looney Tunes character. You know, that weird growling noise that the Tassie team used to make? They sound like that. But anyway, I pet them. I watch them rip apart things, you know, meat and stuff. It was craziness. But they actually are roaming around like mad in Tasmania, which is incredible. So that picture there at the top is Wine Glass Bay. In the bottom, um, those two photos in the bottom right are uh, Port Arthur. Port Arthur is a penal colony that was established in, uh, in Tasmania in 1830. Um, it is enormous. It is, there was a lot of research done there that wasn't exactly pleasant to the human psyche uh, experiments that they did on prisoners back in the 1800s. So it has a very surreal feel, um, but that's, this is how Australia came to be. Um, that's the first people that arrived. So next. <laughs> so thank you very much for traveling with me. Uh, this last photo is a picture that I took on Morton Island. Uh, my favorite thing to do in the universe, uh, in, in the universe, in Australia, is to drive on the sand and my four wheel drive uh, across these sand roads and islands. And I didn't put that in any of the must do's because honestly, you need to work up to that. <laughs> <laughs> it is not for the faint of heart. It can be really terrifying, but it's also super fun. So a uh, little bit about my company there and where to find me. And sorry, Kristen, that I talked three minutes longer than I was supposed to. You're fine. You know, I'm going to leave this up for a little bit longer. And actually, I mean, Jennifer, I don't know if you want to add anything about Worldwise before we go into, into the Q&A. The only thing that I'll mention is uh, that I started the company when I moved back to the States and I came back to Arizona after Kristen mentioned 17 years in a lot of countries. And I thought, what do I do with all that experience implementing projects in 15 different countries and traveling to over 50? And really what I wanted to do was help people to do intercultural business, international business and communicate across borders and give them information that I wasn't given in the significant amount of places that I was dropped into. <laughs> so that's what I do today is I help people do business across borders. And um, it's a little bit about me and all of that. Awesome.